Space Invaders was the first game to have an escalating sense of difficulty. The more aliens you killed, the faster they got, creating a dynamic sense of pacing and progression. But like many a profound innovation, this was discovered by mistake. Due to hardware limitations, the speed of the aliens was severely impaired, and only by killing enemies did this clear up space, both on the screen and processing wise. This mistake maps onto something we are all familiar with by now, flow theory, which states that a sense of engagement can only be preserved if we have a challenge that rises in proportion to a player's abilities. This was the birth of pacing and difficulty progression in games, and has seeped into almost every kind of game. Tetris has its blocks increase in speed as you progress, and all of modern game design manages the tension of a game by using difficulty modulation. Some games increase the number of enemies, like asteroids. Others play with enemy configurations and spatial patterns, something clearly illustrated by the orthogonal unit differentiation of Doom's enemies. But when we step into the modern era, we have silent dynamic systems like in Resident Evil 4, and even AI directors in games like Alien Isolation, that monitor the tension felt by the player and adjust the difficulty accordingly. Even more fascinating, and as Mata Haggis argues in this GDC talk, is that this sense of escalating tension maps onto how stories have always been told, whether three act structures or the hero's journey, so games are charting out an intrinsic plot owing to their difficulty. However, we can now mix and match between play and story, like the brilliantly paced Uncharted series, or we can use other thematic emotions like joy, fear, love, and complicity to manage this tension as well. However, given that games are an interactive medium, this isn't always easy. And this brings us to another one of gaming's seminal progenitors, Pac-Man. Pac-Man popularized the power-up, an instance where a certain pickup either gives you a special ability, a resource, or changes the relationship of the elements at play. In Pac-Man's case, the ghosts who all followed different deterministic AI patterns started fleeing from Pac-Man, and he was endowed with the ability to attack them. How is this revolutionary? Well, think of the state changes that happen in games. Mario has suits you can don to temporarily boost your abilities, Mega Man grants you new powers with every boss you fell, but also, think to how modern game design is ultimately mediated by state changes. The gaming historian Patrick Holloman argues game design has transitioned through three eras, the arcade era, the composite era, and then the set piece era. What started with simple tension modulation gave way to state changes in the form of combined verbs and genre mixing, mediating tension through novelty as well as difficulty, which finally birthed the self-enclosed sequences and set pieces that characterize gaming today. Pac-Man inspired stealth gameplay, open world design, and first-person shooters as well. How? Well, Pac-Man is about avoiding enemies, which inspired Castle Wolfenstein and Metal Gear. Its maze-like level structure can be conceptualized in first person to give you doom, and the top-down grid structure influenced the design of GTA. Each of these has become genres of their own. Now, we not only have these discrete genres, but hybrid mixes of them all. Combine stealth, first-person shooters, and open-world games, and you have open-world immersive sims, which usually have stealth elements. In Nels Anderson's speech on systemic design, he argues systemic games are usually immersive and stealth-based for fascinating reasons. Starting out as a stealth game means the world is in a neutral state, which means the world must exist independent of you, creating a sense of immersion. Also, because you can't interact with elements directly, you have to indirectly interact with the world, meaning it is intrinsically systemic. This shows a continuity between systemic games, immersive sims, and stealth games, which is why Metal Gear Solid 5 easily transitioned into being an open-world stealth game, and why immersive sims with an incredible sense of place like Deus Ex have stealth elements. The history of innovation and creativity in games is one of mistakes, repurposing, and novel fusions, not ex nihilo inspiration from the fates. Being creative as a designer doesn't mean you have to step outside the conventions of the present and revolutionize the way you think, but can equally come from the continuities of innovations from the past and how they have molded design sensibilities over time. The study of creativity from a psychological perspective is still in its infancy, but we do have some preliminary frameworks to interface with. In the Big Five personality model, openness to experience is thought to map onto what creativity is, and this temperament is one where the boundaries between categories of thought is viewed as fuzzy. In his book, Creativity, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi argues creativity involves flooding your mind with an array of disparate ideas and then letting them generate their own synthesis. The ancient Greeks thought the muses inspired artists, the Norsemen thought it was a mead of magical creative properties that infused the world with beauty, and Picasso said we should learn the rules like prose so that we can break them like artists. As game designers, this story tradition of creativity involves we understand the somewhat bizarre isomorphisms that exist between games in the past as a guide to where we might go in the future. In his GDC talk, Practical Creativity, 
Raf Koster echoes these sentiments by suggesting that creativity is ultimately about fusing disparate things together. He starts by insisting we look at the substrate of games and how genres evolve over time. A game comes, then there is a reskin, a variant, a family, then a genre. Let's take Dark Souls. It was reskinned into Lords of the Fallen, then a 2D variant came in the form of Salt and Sanctuary. Then we got a family of souls lights with minor mechanical and thematic variation. We can do this trace with all kinds of genres. Koster himself mapped out the history of shooters in his book, A Theory of Fun, and the book Level Up traced the lineage of platformers. It's fascinating to see how both went from single screen to scrolling to wraparound to 3D. Now think about this. Mega Man effectively combined platforming verbs with the shooting verbs of, well, shooters, to create something new. Is it a platformer or shooter? You tell me. Xevious had dynamic music it inherited from Pong, and this actually inspired Tetsuya Mizuguchi when he made Rez. Rez is an on-rail shooter and music game. What do music games have though? A constant beat, which means a continuously moving pace. Rhythm games play like Simon Says, which was first popularized by Parappa the Rapper, but we can see a continuity between this and Endless Runners. Endless Runners use visual cues whereas rhythm games use musical cues, but then we have games like Bitrip that use both. Of course, the jumping mechanics of these games come from platformers, and the constantly moving pace of a screen came from scrolling shooters, which are, in some strange sense, intrinsically musical. Costa then recommends we look at mechanics, start seeing systems, and develop a library of gameplay and storytelling patterns if we want to bolster our abilities as designers. The most practical definition of mechanic I've come across is in the book Game Mechanics – Advanced Game Design. It can be the physics of movement, animation, or action. It can be an internal economy element, whether lives, resources, or boost bars, a territorial element, or even a progression element, with anything from win states, affordances, constraints, fail states, and framing being relevant. Seeing a game as a system means looking at the abstraction which transforms a game like Gone Home into a game of turning the right object around. However, we also need to understand the versatility, context, and meaning of mechanics if we want to be creative. If we think to 3D Mario, we can combine our jump with movements, do wall jumps, triple jumps, and vary the height of the jump all by adding modifiers to a single verb. In Devil May Cry 3, you can hit a button to strike, or combine it in sequence to create combos, delay them, switch weapons on the fly, and this is all pushed by a context, being the style system that incentivizes novelty, and enemy variation and level design that requires strategic thinking. Combos themselves came from a bug in Street Fighter 2 that allowed linking moves together, and juggling came from a bug in Onimusha that was then implemented in Devil May Cry, which kept enemies afloat in the air. What do I mean by a mechanical context though? Well think about Tekken 7. It is effectively a game of rock-paper-scissors played on multiple dimensions of approach, and the context of the mechanics is the Yomi-mediated play space the player is in. In Mario, the levels need to be calibrated perfectly to Mario's toolset, otherwise it won't create interesting gameplay. Interesting gameplay involves what Sid Meier called interesting decisions, with everything from risk and reward decisions in a game of Tetris, to short-term and long-term decisions in Civilization exhibiting this. The meaning of a mechanic is either what it means in terms of the game system, or in terms of its fiction. I did a whole video on this, but the example that illustrates this best is always Eco. You are a disempowered kid, so you are hard to control. Forcing us to hold on a button to guide Yorda around simulates intimacy, and stripping away a health bar and tying our well-being to hers is a brilliant way to get us to act selfless. A library of meaningful contextual and versatile mechanics, all pooled together to draw inspiration from, can only be good for creativity. With single-player game structures, we have the famous four-step level design process of Mario, where a new ability is introduced then presented in a safe context before it is ramped up incrementally across a level. We see this pattern in almost all modern platformers and shooters, whether it be Rayman or Mega Man. Now think about Metroidvanias or a game like Zelda, and how they gate certain areas off until you acquire a certain ability. Now think about puzzle games like Braid, The Witness, and Steven's Sausage Roll that always add periodic conceptual leaps to keep the player invested. Braid goes from having the ability to reverse time to having your movement correspond to time. The Witness starts on panels but then slowly incorporates the environment, and Steven's sausage roll lets you release your skewer, and then forces you to start thinking in more creative ways. Finally, think about the subtle spatial structure of games, something highlighted in the GDC talk, Death to the Three Act Structure, and how we can break away from the linear format of other genres into forms that harmonize with the unique interactivity of video games. Here are some other tips that Koster pointed out. Take a pattern and apply it in another context. 
like how a die can be thought of a probability device, a hit point designator, a timer, or even an actual physical building block. Add a dimension, like how every genre jumped to 3D, force a constraint, like how endless runners took away a player-controlled movement from the platformer, or add a verb, an example being how Burnout added the action verbs of Mario to the driving verbs of pull position to create its dynamic play space. You can also change a topology, meaning the shape of the field of play. Or most commonly, why not fuse genres and verbs together in ways you might not have previously considered? I can run through a quick list of some incredible fusions you may not have thought about. Mario combined action games and platformers, Mega Man platformers and shooters, Mario Kart driving games and shooting games, and Zelda RPGs and action games, Res shooting and music games, Mirror's Edge platformers and first-person games, Portal first-person and puzzle games, System Shock RPGs and first-person shooters, and League of Legends and RTS and an RPG. All these can then be recombined even further. Crypt of the Necrodancer took the roguelike formula and added music to it, just like Spelunky added platforming. Dead Cells combined the Metroidvania with the Souls-like and a roguelike, showing how we don't need to limit mashups to simply two. We don't even have to be limited to our own medium when it comes to being creative. Games have borrowed from everywhere, including cinema when it comes to cutscenes and dynamic camera angles, television in the episodic format of The Walking Dead, and even spatial poetry for a game like Flower. Alone in the Dark is credited as the first horror game, and what it did was use cuts, ambiguity, and disempowerment to invoke fear in the player, leveraging the tools of film and theater to create a sense of place. If that was a proof of concept, Resident Evil refined the formula, invoking dread and despair with exacting precision. One of the first narrative-based games was Zork, and we could trace its lineage to understand the story structures of games. It used text to create its world, and a powerful sense of place. This influenced games like Adventure, as well as games like Myst, which has an incredible sense of history and place that enraptured millions of players when it first released. It can even be seen as the progenitor of dynamically interactive software, like Facade and Detroit, and role-playing games like Ultima. Because story and gameplay were intertwined into one structure, it shows how the structure and tension of a game can be thought of in the context of gameplay or story. I don't want to get too into the weeds of where specific innovations came from, but it's worth noting which games through history have influenced the most creators, and that gives us a sense of the lineage of creative inspiration in the medium. Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Zork, and Super Mario are some of the most cited inspirations, and I've already gone through their influences. Doom-inspired shooters as varied as Quake to Half-Life and Halo and Halo itself transformed how we thought about shooters. What did these games present as new though? Halo made console shooters viable, using things like increased auto-aim, but also introduced subtle things like an epic story, regenerating health, and matchmaking. In turn, Halo borrowed the orthogonal unit differentiation of Doom, as well as pioneering behavior tree scripts that were influenced by the finite state machines of Pac-Man. What's strange is how Halo and Call of Duty are pitted against Doom as being representative of a more shallow design philosophy when it comes to shooters. They have much more linear levels, and lots of designers today comment on this disconnect. However, as Matthias Warch asserts in his GDC talk, what's actually relevant is meaningful choice in a play space, which is mostly retained in newer shooters. Even Dead Space has the same enemy variation as Doom, but creates its interesting decisions in its weapon design and selective limb dismemberment. Understanding the context under which certain mechanics make sense is seemingly very important, and is something Platinum Games spoke about in a GDC talk of theirs. They emphasize the importance of situational design over just functional design, which means crafting tools and mechanics that make sense in a certain systemic context. For example, Devil May Cry 2 is a much maligned sequel because it haphazardly threw in wide open levels, hurting the game's pacing and flow, and the overpowered guns made it a perverse dominant strategy Halo 2's decision to restrict the player to two weapons might seem constraining on the surface, but it actually forced the player to make interesting tactical decisions before they entered a particular battle. Other games after Halo seemingly just replicated the system without understanding the context this was created under. The design of the game was such that battles were a series of self-enclosed playgrounds with a particular possibility space, and so regenerating health and limiting the weapons repertoire made it so that they could design without having to worry about continuity and resource management across the game. Situational design extends to many other areas of game design too. In his GDC talk, Holistic Level Design, Chris Lee speaks about the importance of creating intentionality or enabling the player with a set of tools that allows them to plan and anticipate the effects of their action and to respond accordingly as well. Immersive sims, systemic games, and stealth games all create this in the context of their systems. 
Think of how Zelda Breath of the Wild allows you to combine its climbing mechanic with stasis to propel you over large distances. Games of this ilk enable player creativity by letting them fuse elements of their own volition, bringing the idea of creativity full circle. However, all this does not mean functional design is unequivocally bad, it all depends on the aesthetic of play you are trying to deliver on. Overwatch has discrete champions that create interesting decisions, synergies and counterplay, but Call of Duty's multiplayer allows you to customize your loadout in intricate detail because enabling player expression seems to be their primary design goal. Resident Evil 4 is another game that is cited as seminal in game design circles, with its over-the-shoulder camera being pervasive in third-person games to this day. It can be seen as the progenitor to games like The Last of Us and Gears of War, with it being used for different purposes in each of those games. The Last of Us combined stealth gameplay with horror elements. Gears of War combined the camera with Killswitch's cover system to create the revolution that is cover shooting mechanics. Of course, to find the real origin of cover shooting, we really should go back to Space Invaders, but we'll leave it at that. Gears of War's cover system created an immersive feel and had a battlefield that emphasized moving from cover to cover. However, lots of games that emulated it didn't seem to understand this context and so many a cover shooter turned into stop and pop affairs with very little in the way of interesting decisions. In the GDC talk, Design in Detail, the speaker argues the reason cover shooters became popular is because it allows players to just worry about one analog stick as opposed to two, making it much more accessible to new players. Regardless of the cause, others arguing it being the rise of hitscan weapons and linear level design, it's important to understand the context and purpose of the mechanics to begin with. Vanquish had a creative take on the cover system, with it being there as a way for you to recover if you take too much damage in its high-octane boost-filled gameplay, making it a punishment of sorts as opposed to a primary feature. A game that was extremely important to fighting games was Street Fighter 2, as it introduced multiple characters, asymmetrical play, and combos into the fold. Everything from Mortal Kombat to Virtual Fighter and then Tekken took these lessons and then applied them differently in their own context. Raf Costa argues that there are only five fighting games, but if we look at each of these games' Yomi-mediated decision tree, very different strategic dynamics emerge from them. When we turn to open world design, what Scott Rigby argues as situationally relevant in its design is not having an infinite array of things to do, but creating activities that meet a player's core psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. GTA has a superficial sense of engagement, Skyrim a more pronounced one because we can choose what we want to be, but Mass Effect the most powerful version owing to its professed ability to change the world. However, the ending of 3 broke that illusion, which actually ruined the experience for many. Instead of thinking about sheer size for open world design, perhaps we should be thinking of the breadth of activities we can craft that actually fulfill the needs a player has. Dark Souls has been something of a revolution, making difficulty fun again and emphasizing the power of environmental storytelling, ambiguous meta-narrative, and meaningful mechanics. Journey propelled the games' art discussion back into the spotlight, showing how we could use theming to govern design decisions and inspiring indie games like Abzu and Grease. Walking simulators put themes and environmental storytelling above all other considerations and share a lineage with Zork and Myst. The Last of Us grounded the cinematic aspirations of Naughty Dog in mechanics that made sense in the world it was crafted for, and games like Limbo, Little Nightmares, and Inside all share the idea of having a child in a universe that cares little for their presence in it. What do all these games cite as inspiration for their design? Well, it's Fumito Ueda's game Eco. Eco showed the power of meaningful mechanics, environmental storytelling, the utility of escort characters, the importance of designing for a theme above all other considerations, and emphasizing ambiguity and disempowerment in its fiction, lore and design. It truly leveraged the power and strength of an interactive medium, and transformed the way Hidetaka Miyazaki, Neil Druckmann, and even Hideo Kojima have viewed games. Eco was doubly brilliant because it still managed to have engaging puzzle design and tense combat sequences, while still keeping it grounded in its fiction and themes. Eco broke the gates open when it came to thinking about themes as the core design philosophy in games, Fumito Ueda himself citing a philosophy he calls design by subtraction. It involves stripping away anything that does not reinforce the core themes of a game, something most thematically driven indie developers now follow. Another interesting thing this highlights is why we still don't seem to have a place for certain genres, be it Souls-likes, Roguelikes, walking simulators, or even character action games. We still define our genres by mechanics, be it first-person shooters, role-playing games, and platformers, as opposed to the core emotions they convey, 
The aesthetics of play model asks us to look at games from the perspective of the reasons people play them, whether challenge, competition, escapism, cooperation, or fantasy. Erin Hoffman argues for a broader array of thematic emotions from love, hope, Sophia, challenge, and complicity, and the book Game Invaders argues for a scientific method of measuring the core mechanical base of a game and determining what their meaning is in the context of a system. These are all interesting solutions and point out why we seem to be stuck as a medium, at least creatively, when it comes to assigning a game to a category. We are stuck with Walking Simulator because we don't recognize that Gone Home is about fear, regret, and reconnection, the Stanley Parable, the relationship between freedom and control, and Edith Finch about wonder and hope in the face of tragedy. Souls-likes share a core suite of mechanics, being deliberate combat, a macabre world, and punishing difficulty. But is this really what the games are about? Or is it a sense of tragedy and hope in the face of hardship, in conjunction with a quasi-metroidvania feel? I'm not saying I know what the answer is here, but it's clear that we have reached the limits of a restrictive, mechanics-intensive paradigm. Looking past the surface characterization of games reveals patterns that repeat across genres. SimCity set the template for systemic playgrounds, Civilization established the framework for turn-based strategy games, and Dune 2 set the benchmark for real-time strategy games. However, if we look to these game systems, very similar dynamics emerge. In Michael Seller's book, Advanced Game Design, he argues the systems of a game come in three flavors, engines, economies, and ecosystems. Engines are systems that require you to decide between keeping a resource or using it. Economies allow you to trade and convert between resources, and ecosystems are self-sustaining feedback loops generated by the elements of a game. All the genres these games inspired draw from the same lineage of design. They are all about balancing resources, building bases, and, in the vein of Sid Meier's claims about the importance of interesting decisions, making trade-offs in the short term and long term, whether it be by maintaining your city's integrity or outlasting your enemies in a war of attrition. On top of this, interesting meanings pop out of these systemic structures, like how SimCity models the inevitability of urban decay and how civilization promotes a specific rhetoric about how history unfolds. Games like RimWorld and Dwarf Fortress lean on these aspects, creating dynamic platforms for player-created stories. There are still important differences between all these genres of games, but again, we may need to examine where we generate the dividing line between them. Take the controversial divide between Western RPGs and Japanese RPGs. The Western tradition established an early template with games like Ultima and Wizardry, whereas the Japanese aesthetic was set by games like Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. Western RPGs tend to be more about enabling players to create their own character, fitting the fantasy component in the aesthetics of play model, whereas JRPGs usually have an established cast of distinct characters. The themes of these respective games are also very different, with medieval fantasy and sci-fi being pervasive in the Western canon, and themes inspired by anime, visual novels, and manga being more popular amongst Japanese devs. At a gameplay level, each genre has switched between real-time and turn-based battles, perhaps suggesting a divide based on reactive or intentional play that divides turn-based and real-time strategy games too. Conversely, they both feature engines and ecosystems in the systemic sense, and are ultimately about enabling player expression and choice. You tell me how we actually classify these games, especially when something like Dark Souls has decidedly Western role-playing sensibilities, but being developed by a Japanese developer who played Western role-playing games as a youth that he didn't understand. Perhaps it is here, at the edges of precise classification, where new genres are born. Looking at the abstraction, aesthetics, and mechanics underlying role-playing games and systemic games allows us to see the presence of similar patterns in MOBAs, battle royales, card games, tactics games, and MMOs. In Tynan Sylvester's book Designing Games, he reduces multiplayer games to a few non-Nash equilibrium systems, including rock-paper-scissors, matching pennies, or the psychological dynamics of Yomi, uniting competitive games across genre lines. In any case, assembling these patterns so that we might repurpose them in different contexts is something the book Patterns in Game Design attempted to do. Other books, like Game Invaders, have tried to fully map out the family tree of all games by their systems, and Koster himself stressed the importance of compiling a vocabulary of mechanics, systems, and aesthetics. These are all important avenues of exploration for the future of creativity in our medium, However, we still have a lot of work to do to establish a robust language for games. So how can we assimilate the strange twists and turns in the history of creativity and game design when it comes to guiding us in the future? Let me tentatively propose a framework that consolidates the ideas we have come across 
I call it the SMITE framework, which stands for Story, Mechanic, Idea, Theme, and Emotion. When designing a game, we can start from any one of these tent poles and then see where it might take us. On the mechanics front, we have flow, tension, structure, new verbs, combining genres, changing topologies, and adding constraints. However, it also involves new technology. In his talk, The Future of Storytelling, Jesse Schell outlines what he calls head verbs as the new frontier for games. This involves text recognition like in Zork, speech recognition like in Alexa, and facial recognition like in Connect. Jonathan Blow talks about a technique called dynamical meaning, which involves examining what is being said by the rules of your game and then expressing it in a game's fiction. For example, Braid has time manipulation mechanics at the core of its design, so its themes are about regret, change, and redemption. When we turn to design by theming, we have a whole suite of developers who explicitly abide by this. Fumito Ueda has designed by subtraction. That game company starts with a theme, like the hero's journey and journey, and then builds mechanics to reinforce it. And Giant Sparrow, the developers of Edith Finch, started with the theme of wonder and magic, and then built a game around it. When designing with a theme in mind, making sure it permeates every level of your game can maximize its effectiveness. Something Hideo Kojima did with Metal Gear Solid 2. It was generally anti-war, so it encouraged a non-lethal playstyle, but the real theme of the game was about subversion and deception. Everything in the game is a lie, from the fact that we had to play as Raiden most of the time, to Raiden's identity itself, the whole existence of the big shell, the purpose of the S3 plan, and so on. Nothing was as it seems at all levels of the game, asserting the core theme of meme, the idea that we are awash in a sea of false information and thus, need to define our own purpose therein. It may strike you as strange I have divided emotions, ideas, and stories from theme, and to be clear, the lines between these is infinitely permeable, hearkening back to our definition of creativity. However, where we start can influence the direction of design. Emotions refer to a more intangible sense you want to elicit in the player, or a core psychological drive you want to fulfill, whether autonomy, competence, or relatedness. Horror games start with fear, and then create a sense of disempowerment by making you flee, use stealth, or limiting a player's resources. If you think about an emotion, the mechanics you use to elicit them might fundamentally change as opposed to if you start from a mechanic. Two frameworks to keep in mind here are Nicole Lazaro's Four Keys framework and Jack Panksepp's research on affective neuroscience, which should give you a wide array of emotions to start with when it comes to crafting games. Ideas are a fascinating avenue for creative expression and really should be the most fertile ground when it comes to being creative. In Ian Bogos' book, Persuasive Games, he argues games can use their simulation and rules to convince people about ideas and certain points of view. Missile Command tells us about the liabilities of nuclear proliferation by showing us how it all ends in doom, and a game like September 12 advocates against interventionist policy by showing how killing terrorists actually leads to the creation of even more terrorists. However, this does not need to have a political bent, it can simply be about the abstract representation of an idea. Jonathan Blow's game The Witness is about metacognition, or being aware of the trap of thoughts that can push you in perverse directions. It reinforces this with its puzzle design, and the layers of abstraction you ascend upwards through in the game. Nothing is explicit, everything is intangible, but the meaning is there. Think about representing history in Civilization, evolution in Spore, and urban design in SimCity, and the possibilities for exploring ideas should be endless. Being creative with regards to storytelling comes in three forms in my estimation, archetypical, structural, and personal. Archetypical stories include things like the hero's journey and rags to riches tales, but also less commonly invoke stories like love stories, comedies, tragedies, and redemption arcs. We can draw so much from literature, film, and myth in this domain, and use them as a springboard to then infuse with a unique layer of interactivity. Structural changes involve thinking of new story structures, whether it be branching systems like in Detroit, or even quasi-interactive systems like in a game like Facade. And finally, personal tales involves telling the stories of a more diverse array of people, whether it be a person dealing with their father's abandonment in Bound, or the relationship between two girls in The Last of Us Left Behind. With that being said, the thing to keep in mind here is that all these starting points can and should fuse into one another. Games like Bioshock and Nier Automata have heady themes about determinism and existentialism, and convey them using a mix of mechanics, emotions, and the subversion of metanarrative tropes. Hellblade started with the idea of representing psychosis, but they then used mechanics, emotions, and storytelling structures to realize this in inventive ways. New storytelling structures, like dynamic procedural systems in a game like RimWorld, require different forms of modular and systemic story design. In many senses, 
The evolution of cinema parallels the evolution of games. They started with mechanics, that being cinematography, cuts and the like, then established a core set of emotions, the first genres being superficial emotions like horror, comedy and love, but then progressed to deeper thematic content during and after the golden age of cinema. Games seem to be slowly pushing towards exploring deeper thematic, intellectual and personal content, and hopefully it's only a matter of time before we become experts at this craft. With that being said, what has to happen to enable a new Cambrian explosion of creative expression? One thing we do now have is a blossoming indie sector. Although the AAA sector seems to be stagnating creatively, they play an instrumental role in taking ideas from the indie sector and polishing them for a wider audience to experience. Another thing that seems to need to happen is that a broader array of experiences from a more diverse and interdisciplinary set of creators could create the expressive cross-pollination we need to usher in a golden age of gaming. Additionally, we cannot expect there to be too much innovation when a command of programming is a prerequisite when it comes to designing games. This is why, more than anything else, a tool like the upcoming game Dreams excites me more than anything else. In the recently released beta, people seem to prototype new ideas and robust new worlds within a few weeks because it allows artists to actively sculpt things as they would in the real world. I have no idea if it'll be successful, but this seems to be where we need to move towards in the future. Dreams also illustrates another principle through its mechanics, that being the idea of remixing content. As we explored earlier, creativity is mixing together things you didn't consider before, and leveraging the distributed knowledge of a community that shares all their skills with one another seems to be a creative's dream. It preserves independent authorship, being decentralized, but also harnesses synergies, allowing creative expansion. This could extend to the idea of a creative commons, generating a culture where we are inclined to share our work with others, not be overly possessive about it. For creativity to truly flourish though, we need to create a social context that allows artists to fully express their authentic voice, without being concerned about other considerations. This means things like better working conditions, labor unions, and better compensation schemes should all be on the table. Historically, artists thrived in eras like the Renaissance, where there was sharing of knowledge and techniques, pooled wisdom, and artists who were sponsored so that they could focus on their craft. Making games is exceptionally hard, and as easy as it is to become cynical about corporate interference in the medium, I think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, it sometimes takes thousands of dedicated people to bring video games to life. Creativity is ultimately about coming together, and we need to create systems that enable this if we want to see the medium we all love push towards new frontiers we have yet to envision.